Welcome back to Tech Ambrosia. This video went extremely differently than I'd anticipated it going. This video was supposed to be a triumphant celebration of raw computing horsepower, but instead it turned into more of a mea culpa and even a cautionary tale of sorts. The Ryzen 9 5950X is an impressive piece of silicon, but let me be clear, unless you have a very specific workload, it's probably not the right CPU for you, as cool as it is. Let's explore what I did wrong and the state of my gaming and editing PC now that I've spent all this money and time and effort to build it. All said, bottoms up. Now to be clear, I didn't break anything. I didn't let out any of the magic smoke. It's up and running and chugging away right behind me here. But mistakes were made. By me. I did not do enough research about this CPU before I pulled the trigger on buying it. Future-proofing is a lie, we tell ourselves, to justify extravagant PC parts purchases. I'm going to admit something that's extremely painful for me to say. I could probably get 90% of the real-world performance of this CPU in my present-day workflow from a 5800X. Yep. I feel pretty stupid right about now. Also, if you're screaming at the screen right now that the cooler there is not powerful enough to cool the 5950X, you are absolutely correct. Again, I didn't do enough research. AMD lists a TDP of 105 watts for this CPU, but anyone who's used it will tell you that it's perfectly capable of drawing the maximum 142 watts of power that the AM4 socket can deliver. I didn't realize that until I bought it plugged it in, and saw the thermal results I was getting. This cooler was adequate, maybe borderline, at 105 watts, but at 142, it is undersized. And it performs that way. I've never seen a CPU so quick to burst up into the 80s under even modest load. Also, as Optimum Tech and other reviewers have mentioned, the boost algorithm in the 5950X and the way it's interpreted by most motherboards means that the CPU generates more heat under partial loading because it's being fed egregious amounts of voltage in a bid to reach that 5 GHz single core turbo clock. I mention Optimum Tech because I'm managing the CPU's single thread heat output using his very thorough undervolting tutorial. Check it out if you haven't seen it. I'm not sitting on this CPU the way it is. I mean, I'm going to keep using it, but I have several plans to address the heat output. Short term, I have Noctua's NMAM4 UXS mounting kit on the way, which will allow me to mount the U12S cooler 90 degrees counterclockwise, so it'll be in line with my case's airflow, which flows from bottom to top. That should improve the thermals in the short term while I... <laughs> While I do research and find a new chassis for my PC's components and a more fitting cooler for such a beefy CPU. Since my PC uses an inverted layout, there are significantly fewer options available to me, which was one of the reasons I went with the Cooler Master Q500L in the first place. I also wanted a challenge with this build, and 
this case definitely delivered. Maybe not so much rewarding in the long run, but it was definitely challenging to build in. There's talk of the Lian Li O11 Dynamic getting an official invertible version, and if that ends up being the case, that's definitely interesting to me. Otherwise, uh, Be Quiet's Silent Bass series has a number of interesting invertible options, including ones with airflow nowadays. Okay, enough negative talk. This, even in its currently hobbled form, is still a 5950X and is still very fast. Do you want to see how fast? Here, have some benchmarks. Hey, uh, editing Amber here. Um, I was just going through those benchmarks and um, I'm not really portraying the reason that I, I don't think this was a good investment. Um, these benchmarks are the best case scenarios out of all the stuff I tested. Um, in my own workflow, I found that most of the apps that I use, even like Resolve Free, which doesn't support hardware accelerated encoding, um, don't utilize all the CPU cores. Um, Resolve uses between 20 and 50% of the cores, as far as I could tell. Even that, that really impressive Fusion render test only used about 70% of the 5950X. So trying to actually like get a workflow that utilizes the CPU to its fullest potential, like unless you are doing Blender work or Cinema 4D, I don't think there's really a reason to have this CPU. The whole reason I started this video out saying that I thought I could probably get 90% of this thing's performance out of a 5800X is that most of the apps that I use, DaVinci Resolve, Fusion sometimes, Handbrake, um, OBS, they don't use more than 50% of the CPU, so 8 cores would be fine. And with my thermally constrained situation over here on this machine, I'd probably get better performance on a 5800X. Let me show you a little bit behind the scenes of my testing. I've got a couple of captures where I'm running a benchmark and I can show you the, the CPU utilization at the same time, and it's pretty bad. Um, on the other hand, there's some really surprising results, like Guild Wars 2. Uh, I know nobody plays that anymore, but like it's one of my best examples of a very, very CPU-constrained game where it's extremely single-threaded. Uh, and it does show a significant performance improvement on this on this CPU, despite me only using a 1080 Ti, which these days is a um, purely middle-of-the-road graphics card. So I thought it was kind of interesting. Anyway, let's take another look at some more benchmarks, and hopefully you can see why this wasn't such a great idea. Here, for example, is Handbrake, and if I do, like, let's say the proxy 1080p, settings, that automatically selects H.264 using X.264, which is the software encoder. And if I put this, if I start encoding this, we get, uh, what do we get? 87 FPS, which sounds awesome, until you realize that, you know, our CPU performance is, tw what, you were using like 25% of the CPU, maybe 30? sometimes? That's, that's not great. <laughs> uh, 1080p is ridiculous. Um, now, things look better if you use a, a more complex video format of any kind, um, and that can be like... I'm gonna stop this. Yes, really. Uh, for example, this is a 4K60 video, so if I do production max, that's gonna retain the 4K60. So if we do that again, yes, replace it. 
now you can see we are utilizing the whole CPU. Um, and we're also, you know, about half the frame rate <laughs> in, in, <laughs> in, uh, in encoding speed. So that's not amazing, but, oh, there we go. That's more like it. Oh, nope, that was just a blip. We got 87 FPS for just a moment there. But yeah, so we're at like 50, 60 FPS. So it's not as fast, but it does at least utilize the whole CPU. And don't forget, we are we are transcoding a 4K60 video to 4K60. So that in that sense, it makes sense. Um, inside Resolve, using um, let me see if I can simulate this outside of Resolve. But inside Resolve, let's set this to 30 and see if this does the same thing. Go replace. It does not. It still uses the whole CPU. Okay, so like moving around and editing in Resolve, let me let me slide stuff around here for a second. So let's stop that in code. Yes. If I here, if I if I slide this over so you can see what's going on. Nope, don't maximize it, just leave it there. Thank you, Windows. Um, if I scrub around on the track, you can see we're using between 20 and 50% of the CPU. Um, if I do the encode, the way I do this is I always use H.264 master. Let me slide this over so you can see it. There we go. So I usually use H.264 master on my final encode. So let's just put this somewhere. I'll put this on my um, um, my NVMe words. But if I do this render, now of course it's going to show me up and and run at 100%. But no, see we're using 60% you know, of the CPU. This is encoding a ping. Now let's do some video, and you can see with a video stream our encode rate goes down from 50 to 30 FPS and we're using half of the CPU. So then we're going to move into some high bitrate. Oh, no, these are quick cuts. So we've got quick cuts of low bitrate 4K. And again, like it's using half of the CPU. You see what I mean? <laughs> like this... The, I could literally have done this on a 5800X. Ooh, that, it touched 80% there for a, just a moment. <laughs> this is all, this is all quick cuts from the beginning of the video. You recognize this because you'll be watching this on YouTube. Isn't this fascinating? This is what you came here for. This is premium Tech Ambrosia content watching me run my encoder. Well, that's not so bad. It's going to take 15 minutes. That's not doing too badly. My my render output previously was about just doing this, just doing, like, rendering out B-roll and nothing else. It was about 7 FPS. But again, like you can see, this this... I could I could be doing this on a 5800x. I get identical performance, maybe even better performance, because I might not be running at four gigahertz, thermally constrained. You see, my poor CPU down here is hitting 90 degrees Celsius. It's just ridiculous. So anyway, that's really what I wanted to show you. Like, this doesn't make sense, and I kind of regret buying it. And um, hopefully, by making this video, uh, I can show you that maybe it's not the right CPU for you, and you should save your money. Like, that 5800X, that's a serious CPU. Even the 5600X, which is just being kind of canned by the general public, is really great. Yeah, it's only six cores, but it is six very fast cores, and it's a very easy-to-run thermal, thermal load. So, anyway, 
that is my video on the 5950X and why it might not be the best choice for everyone. And it's technically not a great choice for me, but I still have it and I have to live with that decision. Anyway, <laughs> have a great evening and thanks for watching another Tech Ambrosia video. Bottoms up. <laughs>